Good morning. Good morning, Rick Terry. Yes. I'm Joe Avella, President elect of uh, Hudson Rotary, and I'd like to welcome every, uh, all, all of our guests and our Rotarians to a special meeting we have today. I'd like to call upon Jim Ahern for our invocation. In honor of this um, meeting this morning about youth today, uh, here's a prayer about uh, intended for them. Uh, Lord, may the faith of our youth inspire us to greater trust in you. Instill in our youth physical, mental, and moral strength. Clothe them with honor. And grant them with keen vision as they venture toward adulthood. Help them to realize spiritual values and so discern life's true meaning and direction. Help them to move undaunted and unafraid into adulthood. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Please, uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. First, is the truth. Second, is the fair to all concerned. Third, will look well and good will and better friendships. And fourth, will look be beneficial to all concerned. Thank you. I would like to call, uh, oh, please be seated. Good morning, fellow Rotarians and guests. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have a lot of visitors with us today. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, we have probably about a dozen members of the Clock Tower Rotary. So if they would all please stand so we could give them a nice warm welcome. Thank you. We have also our four-way speech contestants and maybe family members and um, teachers. So if we could please um, say hello to Kate Greer, Maria Zhao, Anna McMurchy, and Trevor Levin. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to your speech. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris. I'd like to call upon uh, Gail Royster for uh, an announcement about our, our gala. Thank you. Good morning, Rotarians. Last week we had the kickoff, the launch of our major fundraiser for the year, the gala, the annual gala. And I just wanted to let you know that the letters went in the mail Monday. That's the letters that go out to all of the donors that are on your respective lists. So I'm thinking maybe by Friday would be the ideal time to start your follow-up calls while, you know, it's hot in their hands before it goes in the trash. Anyway, that's all. Just wanted to give you a reminder. Our biggest fundraiser of the year, and our goal this year is to net 40000 which is what we did last year. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. And also, yes, uh, just as a reminder, uh, that uh, we are starting to sell tickets for the gala and to accept your checks for, for your own uh, two tickets, and Ron Barnhouse will be doing that each Wednesday morning, so uh, start to get those checks in. We're going to jump right in with our, uh, with our special program today, our four-way speech, our four-way speech contest, and uh, Jim Ahern, who's running that, here, I'd like to call Jim back. Right. Okay, um, we have a lot to introduce, but I don't think we introduced our helper from service learning. What's your name? Allison. Allison. I got to hear Allison's speech yesterday. If you don't want to know anything about global warming, talk to Allison. She's an expert now, right? right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, welcome to contestants, family, Rotarians. Um, recently, I was talking to my neighbor about uh, the Rotary four way test, and uh, we're talking about a number of things, and he said, Well, I won it and when I was 16 years old. So that's proof that this is at least 
50 years old. He said it had a real positive uh, impact on his life from the time when he was a junior in high school. Uh, but it's actually kind of cool because it's the beginning is based on the four-way test developed by Herbert Taylor in uh, 1932 and adopted by Rotary, Rotary in the early 1940s. Um, speech contest is uh, utilizing the four-way test and uh, is a mirror of current issues today. Um, it's a great test to put um, anything, any dilemma, any issue, anything uh, that's going on in the world right now um, against uh, there's 500,000 business leaders and uh, professionals that have the test uh, on their desk in some way, shape, or form. Pretty impressive. Um, our four finalists um, come in because uh, they're top two from their school, and the school competition took place either a week or two weeks ago. So congratulations for that. And uh, they're, they're, uh, the process today is, uh, is simple. Uh, we're going to ask them to come up. And uh, they've already drawn the order. They're going to know their order. They're going to speak. Uh, they're going to come on right on the stage, jump right into their talk. And after they're done, they'll give a little insight of their name, what school, et cetera. So we get a little bit of information about them uh, from them. And uh, when, all, when they're all done, the judges will move to the back of the room and we'll do the tabulation and come back and uh, share, our, share the results. So, uh, without anything further, uh, our first speaker, I'll show the name later. Great. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. When 22 year old Jack Leeson announced in an interview that he would be retiring from the acting industry, he said, quote, I really did not expect all the subsidiary things that came with being an actor on a successful television program. He continued, What it led to was a sharp shock when I realized that I had, unbeknownst to me, signed an invisible contract which required me to enter into a strange new echelon of society. People suddenly wanted to take my picture on the street. Journalists were interested in what kind of socks I preferred. It was an atmosphere from which I instantly wanted to retreat. I detested the superficial elevation and commodification of it all juxtaposed with the grotesque self-involvement it would sometimes draw out in me, end quote. Ever since 1912, year motion picture companies began film production in this municipality of Los Angeles. Hollywood has attracted worldwide attention. Our American celebrities are the celebrities of Europe, Asia, Australia, and every other part of the world. During the Great Depression, movie stars provided people with an escape from reality. And in communist nations throughout the 20th century, Western celebrity culture inspired teenagers to resist repressive regimes. But what we don't realize is that every face we see in films and music videos, on tabloids, red carpets, and the silver screen has become so shockingly influential. It's time for us to step back and ponder whether the celebrity culture we worship and look up to holds too much leverage in our lives and affects the way we think for ourselves. While examining this topic today, I will use the Rotary four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? So to begin with, is it the truth? Ask anyone on the street. Everyone has a favorite movie star, singer, comedian, professional athlete, runway model, and oftentimes these celebrities can influence our decisions more than we would suspect. We purchase certain products because they're endorsed by Kim Kardashian. We buy the same brand clothing and shoes as LeBron James. 50% of tobacco users smoke because celebrities do so, and 58% of American citizens are more likely to vote for a political candidate that their favorite superstar endorses. When do we let people in Hollywood make our decisions for us, and is this fair to all concerned? Is it fair that celebrity culture has become and is becoming a mold for what we want our lives to look like? In a nation that enjoys freedom of expression, technically it's fair that we express ourselves in the same way as actors and actresses. We're guaranteed freedom of religion, so strictly speaking, it's fair that masses have let celebrities become their gods. But this is not only a question of fairness, but a question of responsibility. We have a responsibility to limit our obsessions with celebrities and to not become their sheep. It is not fair to the public that celebrities, the objects of imitation in modern day society, have warped our world's vision of success and prosperity. Which leads me into my next question. Will the discontinuation to see celebrities as flawless idols lead to the building of goodwill and better friendships? 
I spend every day surrounded by teenagers who visualize a future of fame and fortune. They fantasize about being a wildly popular athlete or singer, envisioning the glamorous parties, prestigious award shows, and talk show interviews. Their concept of happiness would be to be on a reality television program, which is their idea of actual reality, because everything that happens on MTV is just so real. First of all, those shows are about as real as a $12 bill. Secondly, it is vitally important that teenagers realize that success does not mean red carpets, stretch limos, Christian Dior, and your own brand of perfume. This idolization of superstar lifestyle can cause teens to cease looking up to their friends and counselors and instead worship the unreliable dreamland that is Hollywood. When people begin to admire their families, teachers, and real leaders of their community above the celebrity culture, goodwill and better friendships will result. And finally, will formulating our own opinions and goals without the influence of celebrities be beneficial to all concerned? When I say this, I'm not attacking celebrities as individuals. Some stars are very focused on charity and activism, and that's wonderful. But no matter what their humanitarian works have been, they still feed into that Beverly Hills culture and icon worship. People these days watch movies that romanticize violence, drugs, and alcohol. People listen to songs that glamorize parties and sex. The public is manipulated into believing that actors and actresses actually stand for the themes that are promoted in their films. Not realizing that these celebrities are just people doing their job every day and getting paid, not unlike the rest of us. It will undoubtedly be beneficial to all concerned to stop looking to celebrities to determine our reality. So how do we solve this ethical problem? We can't keep people, including myself, from reading the tabloids, and we can't stop teenage girls from obsessing over The Bachelor. But it is vitally important that we encourage. We encourage our friends to find sources other than celebrities when establishing their voting patterns. We encourage our peers to stop looking to glossy magazine covers for the perfect body type. There is such an enormous gap between the Hollywood bubble and the real world. Those who mind the gap are happier, more content with who they are, and less jealous of those dark figures silhouetted by camera flashes walking down the red carpet in the distance. Thank you. All right, uh, my name is Kate Greer. I'm a junior at Hudson High School. Uh, I'm involved in Drama Club, Thespian Society, the Marching Band. I'm an editor for the student newspaper, and I'm president of the German Club. Uh, I'm only a junior, but I already hope to attend Ohio State University in the fall of 2016, uh, where I would hopefully like to major in public affairs journalism and international studies with a minor in the German language. It would be my dream after I get out of school to teach English in Germany for at least a little while, and hopefully in the distant future. Uh, work for a news station as a travel or political journalist. Thank you very much. Uh, a little lull for a minute or two while the judges uh, finish their scores. <coughs> you might let it just rest on the uh, four <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she is. Happy these guys so, a lot of times, the only time you hear about the schools is when you are going to be in the right place for the So, I like it when they see all the, you know, we bring in coaches. Service learning, a lot of coaches. So you in service learning? Yeah, so what else have you done in service learning? Um, well, first semester I was I volunteered at a movie show. Wow. Honestly, I've changed. 15 years later. Yeah, right. And now I'm at East Coast. Oh, yeah, yeah. Honestly, it's different. Oh, that's great, yeah. 
kind of get you out of your comfort zone. <laughs> Let's talk about politics for a minute. It's not really what my speech is about, so no need to brace yourself for controversy. But back in January, the New York Times ran an article about Senator John McCain who had recently become the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee after the Republicans assumed control of the Senate. And one sentence in particular from this article caught my attention. It said, Mr. McCain finally has the only job in Washington, other than being president, that he ever wanted. And I read that and I thought, wow, John McCain is 78 years old, and he has been in Washington for 32 years. Imagine spending 32 years of your adulthood, thinking about life in terms of going from stepping stone to stepping stone. Yet people commonly value each station in life only in its capacity to get us to the next one. I will submit the following proposal to the Rotary four-way test. We need to start valuing this station, the present, inherently. Now, I don't actually think that is true about John McCain. He's had a pretty good run as senator. But I don't need to look to Washington to verify that it is true. I go to prep school, so named because apparently it prepares us for admission to and success in these elite universities. At every turn, we as students are reminded of the college-related implications of our decisions, from what classes we take, to what clubs we join, to how we spend our summers, and while it's necessary to think about and prepare for the future, when we so far remove our focus from the present, it's easy to start thinking of these four years as nothing more than an audition for the next four. Now, is this really a problem? In an article in the New Republic called Don't Send Your Kid to the Ivy League, a former Yale professor, William DeResowitz, explains that essentially this attitude reduces childhood to a competition to accrue the 10 most impressive extracurricular bullet points. And indeed, in any part of our lives, if we see it only as transitory, it'll pass us by without us ever having fully engaged in it. Now there's nothing wrong with working towards your future, but if we pursue our passions purely for the purposes of personal profit. We cheapen the present because we begin to view our surroundings as a means to an end, including the people in those surroundings. And that's unfair. If we treat the people around us, our colleagues, our teammates, our neighbors, as a means to an end, we're being unfair to them. We'll be less kind and less empathetic. After all, we're prioritizing our own ambitions over their well-being. But if we value the present inherently, then the, our surroundings and the residents thereof assume a meaning inherent to them. We begin to view them as an end in and of themselves. Thus, my proposal satisfies part two of the Rotary four-way test. It is fair to all concerned. Now for part three, I ask you to imagine a hypothetical college freshman who has recently concluded that his next four years are the gateway to his next 40, and little else. He needs to focus, then, on three things. His academic performance, his employment opportunities, and networking. And what I mean by that is it's illogical for him to form any friendships other than those he thinks will either last him forever, or more cynically, those he thinks will advance his career goals. What sort of friendships do you think those would be? Calculated? selfish, disingenuous, to allow for <coughs> spontaneity and fun, and indeed for genuine human connection, we need to view friendship as something good, not as something useful. In other words, we need to see that the benefits friendship offers us in the present are what make it valuable, not the opportunities it affords us in the future. Finally, for part four of the test, Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Certainly. If 
we interact with the people around us considerately, rather than treating them as a means to an end, our friendships and our communities will be stronger. And if we make our decisions on what to do, not because it'll look good on a resume, but because we genuinely, genuinely believe that that's the best way we can spend our time now, then our intentions will be more pure, our actions will be more honest, and we will be happier. No one in this room, I'm assuming, is John McCain. But I ask you this, what is your chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee? I'm not asking that you give it up, but I will ask that you don't wait until you get there to start treating the journey as the destination. Thank you. I'm Trevor Levin. I'm a senior at Western Reserve Academy, and I am apparently I have much less of a fully formed idea of my life. <laughs> uh, I don't know where I'll be attending college in the fall, though I have some options, and uh, I have no idea what I'm majoring in. But 
this type of racial prejudice is definitely not the only way that people unfairly judge others based upon their outward physical <coughs> appearances. According to a study done by the Bowling, Bowling Green State University, people with a higher body mass index and are overweight are less likely to be accepted to grad school when they participated in an in-person interview, simply because stereotypes based on a person's weight that people who are obese are fat and lazy prevented them from being accepted to these graduate schools. This is not fair. It's not fair to all concerned that when given two resumes that are the exact same with the only one difference being the names of the people, one obviously American and the other obviously Asian, when given these two resumes, <coughs> companies would rather choose the person with the name that sounds American rather than the one they may not know how to pronounce. It's not fair that people are judged based upon their skin color. Young black men are 21 times more likely to be shot and killed by the police than young white men. It's not fair that just because of your skin tone, you are more likely to be killed. Women are paid 30% less than men are for working at the same job just because they have a different set of genitalia. Further, these types of group-based prejudices based against how a person looks on the outside, it does not build better friendships. When my sister first moved to America from China, she was five years old. She started the first grade, but nobody would talk to her simply because she looked different and sounded different. She talked with the Chinese accent. And she spent a whole year at her school with no friends because nobody was brave enough to go up and poke at this exotic little creature that came over the ocean. But when she moved to her new school district, Hudson, actually, she, one girl was brave enough to talk to her. One girl was brave enough to break through that racial barrier. And they became fast friends because that girl realized that my sister on the inside was a special person, that she was kind, nice, smart, funny. And they're still friends today, 10 years later. Things like these, racial prejudices like these, not only <coughs> prevent friendships, but they also prevent everybody from being benef benefited. Once people start hiring people based not if their name sounds American, but based upon their abilities and skills. <coughs> Companies will prosper. People who have the ability, people who have the skills, people who are smart and able will be able to move up the social ladder and achieve their dreams rather than being eliminated by their name, something that they had no control over choosing. Once people stop thinking that all people who are over overweight and obese are fat and dumb, people will find all these new geniuses, people will learn more things from all these new people that they realize are very intelligent. Once people start realizing that not all people of African descent are able to be killed by the police, people will also, there will be less crime and there will be more love in the world for people and more respect for people's <coughs> abilities rather than hate based just upon how a person looks and if they sound different. But so many benefits that can be reaped from not judging people based on how they look, not judging people on their race. Why don't we? Maybe it's just because it's human nature. It's human nature that people just take seven short seconds to judge a person based on how they look. But what if next time, next time we meet someone new, we take, instead of seven seconds, maybe just seven minutes, seven minutes to actually understand what the person is like, look into their heart and understand their actual views on things and understand what kind of person they actually are. And maybe then we can make it true that people are judged fairly and not judged based upon what they look like. And maybe then we can make sure that we're building better friendships and we're meeting new people. And maybe then we will be benefiting all those around us. And maybe then we can make the world a better place. Thank you.
Emily thought she knew where she wanted to go to play the college. Yeah, So, on the recording, you'll be able to hear it, just be quieter. <laughs> As humans, more specifically as Americans, we are constantly on the lookout for faster, more efficient ways of doing things. This simple fact is the driving force behind the thousands of new inventions we see cropping up around us every year. And now, in the very near future, we may begin to see an exciting new scientific achievement, quite literally popping up all around us and taking to the sky. Their little propellers beating tirelessly against the wind as they swoop off to accomplish their various tasks. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, drones are no longer the fantastical stuff of science fiction thrillers. They are here, fully functional and ready to fly. If only the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, would give them the green light to do so. Drones have caused significant issues for the FAA, mainly because of the uncharted territory into which they are entering. How does one go about placing restrictions on an entirely new type of product? Should it be someone's right to utilize this tool that they have invested so much time in creating? Today, I will use the rotary four-way test to provide a solution to this dilemma. I believe one of the most helpful ways in which drones can benefit our everyday lives is by operating as a delivery service for mail and packages. Amazon Incorporated has already announced its intentions to launch Amazon Prime Air, an operation that would get drones out into the field as soon as the FAA grants them permission. Is it the truth that their program will offer a more efficient, cost-effective way to ship products to customers? According to an online article by Business Insider, yes, indeed it is. The article states that Amazon's current shipping cost averages about $5, while the use of drones could bring that number as low as $2. Also, Amazon says their drones would be able to deliver packages to customers in 30 minutes or less, provided that the package weighs under 5 pounds, which accounts for 86% of their deliveries. Now, some people may express concern about the workers who currently deliver packages via large, rumbling trucks that are unfortunately limited to the strict confines of paved roads. What will these delivery men and women do for work if the drones put them out of business? Fortunately, in a solution that answers the question of whether drone delivery would be fair to all concerned, RoboHub assures us that all drones would need to have two people manning them to oversee their operation and ensure that things run smoothly. Now, not only would drones be fair to the employees of the delivery industry, they would also provide more equal services for all of its customers, regardless of their location. Since drones can go where no cumbersome truck has gone before, People who live in rural areas, well off the beaten path, will be able to receive their goods in a much shorter amount of time. The same goes for folks who live in cities, where heavy traffic might otherwise bring delivery to a grinding halt in the throngs of a stop-and-go traffic jam. Now, you might think that this could soon become an issue in the air as well, but the great thing about aerial traffic is that there could be layers. 
down here, we've only got one flat, measly plane on which we can drive. But once vehicles get airborne, they gain the advantage of a third dimension. Even though these devices have already been invented, I still sometimes find myself marveling at the novelty of it all. I remember that back when I was a kid, I had to get off the internet if my mom wanted to use the telephone. <laughs> That's not good, right? It makes me feel downright ancient. <laughs> Another question we must answer when analyzing the possibilities that these drones present is whether they will build goodwill and better friendships. I believe that the new and improved delivery service that they offer will enable everyone to have access to a more cost-effective and downright fun way to send messages, gifts, and goodies to their friends and loved ones. This will certainly build widespread feelings of goodwill, because it means that all of your last-minute anniversary and Mother's Day gifts could arrive with lightning speed, thus saving Fido from many a cold night during which his doghouse would have otherwise been occupied. <laughs> Better, closer friendships can be formed through the tighter connections that delivery drones can provide. If it becomes cheaper and easier to send goods via this new system, people will be more inclined to connect with others with whom it may previously have been difficult to stay in touch. Lastly, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Yes, a drone delivery system presents a number of benefits, and not just for Amazon customers or employees. These drones will run off of electricity rather than gasoline, the current fuel source used by most delivery trucks. This will reduce harmful emissions, thus contributing to a cleaner atmosphere, which can be appreciated by all. Additionally, Amazon Incorporated sees safety as its top priority. In its open letter to the FAA, requesting exemption from certain civil aircraft restrictions, they spend two whole pages detailing the precautions they will take to ensure a safe experience for everyone. While I understand that the Federal Aviation Administration has difficult decisions to make regarding the operation of these small, unmanned aircraft, I believe they ought to expedite their decision on the issue and grant Amazon and other companies permission to conduct the research and development ne necessary to get this program off the ground. The rotary four-way test has convinced me that these drones offer too many benefits to be ignored. I hope Amazon will be able to achieve its goal of putting drones into effect by the end of 2015, though perhaps I'm partial as an Ohioan because we are, after all, the birthplace of aviation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anna McMurchy. I'm a senior at Western Reserve Academy. And I'm still waiting to hear back from most of my colleges, so I'm not sure where I'll be attending. But I'm hoping to do a double major in mechanical engineering and creative writing with a minor in performing arts. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're going to ask the judges, which I'm glad I'm not one of, uh, to uh, go to the back of the room and we'll do all our calculations and uh, be back soon. No one's figuring out who's going to ring a doorbell. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jen. We'll conduct a little business uh, during while the uh, judges are tallying up their scores. Uh, this past uh, this past Saturday, uh, we had the Hudson Expo. Understand it was a huge success. And uh, we participated. I'd like to thank uh, Jimmy Sutton for organizing uh, our participation in that. Uh, Allison and Ken Feaster did the, did the setup uh, on Friday night. I know that Den Rich was there, Evan McCauley, Jim Young uh, were there. Uh, I'd like to thank them and Larry Santon and Tom Tobin for being there and, uh, and uh, tearing down the equipment and then, uh, and then bringing it back. So uh, I'd like to call upon Den, who has a little bit more information about, that, uh, about the expo. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, and good morning, Rotarians. Good morning. I think particularly we want to uh, recognize the fact that some non-Rotarians did a wonderful job for us. Kent Feaster, among others, set up. Um, I had to leave before the late Larry Santon got there, but, oh, I'm sorry, Larry. <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow, Jen. We did have some very good ideas that we were unable to execute. Uh, among other things, uh, the new Rotarians 
brought over uh, some written materials and then disappeared. <laughs> we, uh, we came up with a great idea that we should have had uh, free tickets for our gala that we could put in for a drawing and to take down email addresses so that we could then plague them for a while until they bought tickets. Um, we didn't get a chance to do that, but we're going to do it next year. Um, I was able to uh, lean on Rotarians to take posters and put them up. You know, heck, well, I haven't participated in this expo for five or six years, and uh, I have to hand it to Carolyn Conifal and the uh, Chamber of Commerce because it was it was a big affair. It was easy to get lost among all those uh, booths. But we were able to uh, place a number of posters for our gala, and uh, particularly with uh, Chris uh, Barker, who was there for Morgan, Dave Basil, one of our outstanding members and members of council. Art LaFountain was able to take and display one of our posters. Dan Williams, I was able to consult with and learn a lot about uh, several things going on here. Uh, Jim Young. Liz Murphy is, was running a Destination Hudson booth, and uh, I think very encouraging, although she tried to sell me a model of the <coughs> clock tower. <laughs> and I had to inform her that those of us who live here at Laurel Lake have not only just given away everything that we could get out of the house, but uh, I can't buy anything without first consulting uh, with my wife as to what are we going to throw away in order to make room for it. <laughs> this is uh, this is just a way of living. Um, we did run into some people interested in Rotary Exchange programs. This is, of course, where our students go overseas and we take in overseas uh, guests. Uh, this is something that I would like to see our cluster of clubs uh, get back into the business uh, because I think it's been very progressive and it's a, it's a terrific way for people to gain real experience in people who don't look like themselves, don't speak like themselves, and often don't act like themselves. It's an educational system that we want. Um, I would also like to uh, use this moment to uh, push all of my fellow Rotarians to get out there and talk to the potential sponsors of our event. We've got already $9,000 in. I'm pleased with that part. Um, we've got a brand new sponsor uh, for this year that we haven't had in previous years. Just happens to be Laurel Lake Retirement Community. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, right, right. Um, by the way, Evan McCauley was apparently interviewed after I left. HCTV arrived and interviewed him with regard to the gala. So we've got that coming up that we can see. Um, finally, uh, I'm going to try and get some training in operating a video camera. And I would urge those of you who have potential donors for our uh, gala, uh, who are merchants and have a place of business that they would like to have seen on HCTV, and for that matter, in the newspapers, to contact me. Let's arrange a time when I can take that camera, get down there, and interview those potential donors. We can increase, I think, the enthusiasm and attendance, and maybe some of the better gifts for our upcoming gala. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Dan. Uh, just some uh, further announcements. I heard from uh, Liz uh, Ramsey last night. Uh, uh, Liz, uh, as you know, had some knee surgery and she's uh, pretty much under the weather. She, she's not allowed to drive for the next six or eight weeks, but she wanted to uh, uh, wanted to ensure us all that uh, they will still have the rotary tea on, uh, on April the 25th here. So, so she's, uh, she's doing pretty well. Um, we're going to, uh, oh, another, uh, another announcement. Uh, the Rotary District Conference and Training Session, uh, which they do annually, is going to be held on April 24th and 25th at the Doubletree Hotel in, in Independence. So uh, all Rotarians are cordially invited to attend. There's a number of programs that be, it starts on Friday at noon with, with a, a, a very good speaker. Uh, continues Friday night and all day Saturday. So 
we'll have more information about that. We'll put some things up on our website about that, about how to register. But uh, that should be a very, uh, that, that's, that's a very uh, well worthwhile uh, event if you have an opportunity to, to do that. Um, we've got some time, so uh, let's, we're, we're going to have some happy news. Uh, James, you have a, um, a mic? Oh. Uh, uh, anybody <laughs> have any happy news, news today? Uh, so, and, and there's no charge. Today's fine day, but we're not going to charge you for, for any happy news. Rich? I don't know if it's happy. It could lead to unhappy. But my son turned 18 this morning, so I guess I can kick him out of the house now, right? <laughs> <laughs> or make him pay rent. Yeah. Well, right. I'll offer up the uh, Hudson boys who won their division, uh, basketball won their division outright. Uh, Coming from a little bit, you know, slow start against Twinsburg. I think uh, they're playing tonight, right? Tonight, tonight at 7 o'clock at home. So if you want to see an exciting game, uh, come over and uh, see the basketball game tonight. Who are they playing? Is it Barberton? Uh, I think so. It's first round of the playoffs. I think, I think they're paired against Barberton. We think it's Barberton. Okay. Cool. Anybody else? I'll just also throw in, it's not necessarily happy news, but we've had, I mean, this part is happy news. We've had a lot of people sign up and donate for the Relay for Life. Uh, <clears throat> I'm on the committee, uh, and so we presented to the student government yesterday, uh, and it looks like they'll get behind it and, uh, and hopefully sponsor some teams. Uh, so there, there's no charge to join. I'll bring, I don't have them with me right now, but I'll bring back the forms. Also, if you, uh, if you Google Hudson Relay for Life, It'll also take you to the website, and you can sign up there. Uh, Western Reserve Academy, obviously, can also have teams as well. That takes place, uh, doing this from memory, I believe it's May 30th, so it's the weekend after Memorial Day. That's not Memorial Day. Um, and school just have ended, at least for Hudson. Uh, so invite everybody to uh, uh, join up from Rotary. We have a team, and then also invite our guests if you want to form teams. It's a, it's a really great activity. I think it's been going at Hud on in Hudson something like 14 years. Okay, good. Nobody has anything else. We'll take a brief, uh, brief intermission while we're waiting for our judges to come back. <laughs> I got rights. I said, oh, you got rights? Yeah, right. That's so real. <laughs> you know, you said there's a right? Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is like, you know, why you're in this room. You're safe. Yeah. Let's talk about this. It's cool. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. Well, you're 18. What do you say? Yeah. 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 You're right, you do, but, yeah. but when you move out, that's when you can exercise. I got a right. I would be filming. So, I'm very good. So, what time do you ask? Well, I go to sleep. Is that right? Oh, okay. You know what? So, um, I get there, but I don't know if it's going to be this is actually you will be broadcast your your filming will be broadcast on Put that on your list. <laughs> there you go. Just some filmography. You stepped it out of space. Oh, there we go. Well, this is the part that's the most fun and the worst part because um, because the way we run this, um, we're going to have four folks that we're going to separate, and I'll tell you, uh, trying to uh, put uh, lines between these these four uh, speakers is, is really difficult. Um, before we go any further, I want everybody to give a big hand to everybody. Uh, I want to introduce the, the judges who volunteered to do this. Uh, Bill Woolridge, you want to stand? Chris Barker? Jessica Armbruster and Chuck Weedy. Thank you very much. And my partner, Brian from the Upper Rotary, Ted Olson, thank you very much. He'll be helping hand off the money and the trophy. So, um, as I said, this is the hard part. Uh, all of them, this is the best of the best that, that came out. So these were, uh, they're all winners. And um, uh, the 
the winner from this will be going on to the district competition um, in, uh, in Aurora on April 11th. And everybody's got April 11th open. Uh, it's a great morning for those of you who have attended. It's um, pretty powerful. There's one guy who was there a few years ago. I think he's going to be governor. I swear. <laughs> he was so amazing. I just wanted his autograph. He was, uh, he was that good. So, without any further ado, four of the uh, four speakers would please come up. Start with um, the winner of one hundred dollars, Maria. And the winner of two hundred dollars, drumroll, Trevor. Before we're done, also, if someone has a, a nice camera phone. Uh, we can take a picture when we're done. You can't hear me? Okay. Uh, the, uh, these were really close. And so the, uh, the winner of $300, who is, if for some reason the first place winner can't go, uh, they would be asked to go and take their place. Uh, Kate Greer. <laughs> and the winner, Anna McMurchie. Uh, Anna represented us last year, and so we tried to make sure that had that not influenced us, but uh, you performed well, and you all did an absolutely fantastic job. Does someone have a uh, camera here? We can get a picture. Great. Very strong. in a little bit. Yeah. Solid. Solid. I know. Yeah. I know. Okay. One more. One last applause. Thank you. So thank you, Jim, and thanks to all of our uh, contestants and family uh, for being here. Uh, before we wrap up the meeting, I'd like to, a couple of thank yous. I'd like to thank uh, Peter Goheen for uh, being our greeter today, our audiovisual and setup crew, uh, uh, Larry Santon, Tom Page, uh, Jimmy Sutphin, James Field, and Ron Barnhouse, and handling video today from Service Learning, Allison Rents. So thank you for all of us. Our next uh, meeting next week is uh, uh, March 11th. Will be our speaker will be. Uh, Becky Moreland, she's the founder of the Ministry of Hope, and she will be speaking on human trafficking. So, uh, be, oh, yes, R wrote about it, it's on my list, it's on my list. <laughs> and it's only $11, wrote a book drawing, is $11, and, uh, and the uh, uh, jackpot is $340. <laughs> okay, the winning ticket, the last uh, three digits, seven, one, zero. Seven one zero. Every day there's a winner. Yeah. <laughs> oh, pick again. Oh. For eleven dollars. Thank you. Yeah, that was close. Good. Like marbles in there. You know, you lower your money. Oh, for 11 hours? <laughs> Thank you very much. Enjoy your day. Thank you.